you probably know some stuff about this, you've seen the film. And from this rather small and boring, some of you have been at Nexus Town Line, you know that for sure, and a rather boring little park, uh, the simple part came a resistance movement that none of us ever expected. Uh, there was nothing like this since 1980 in Turkey, uh, not on a large scale, in individual cities for specific uh, reasons sometimes, but not in multiple cities. At this point, it's not just about the park anymore. Uh, what we want to do here is sort of twofold. One is to relate to you to the best of our ability what happened uh, in Turkey, uh, and also doing this, we're talking to our friends, our colleagues, but you're also media scholars, so we'd like to keep a special eye out for the media aspect of all of this. Uh, and there has been actually a pretty good panel this morning covering this, but there were um, you know, some of you may have been there. That was more theoretical, we're, we're more relating our own experiences now. And thus, this is a very subjective uh, discussion right now. Uh, the other thing we want to do is also that a lot of people from Turkey here, and we might use this as a way to discuss what to do next and so on, much like the neighborhood forums that have sprung up uh, in various cities after the events. So we'd like to uh, do like very little introductions here, person here will talk about five minutes um, about the background, about the part itself, about the media aspect of it. And the Q&A, everyone will have two minutes. That's what we're doing in the, in the other parts right now, because since the police uh, liberated Gizit from the occupiers, people are not allowed to go in. Uh, and to go back to the, this whole thing being very subjective thing, I want to show you one more picture. Um, this is the son of another next member who's not here right now. Uh, so this is our park. I mean, the, the, I'm going off my way. So the moderator's benefit here. Uh, I have lived in Tatsum all my life. I grew up in that park. Um, and a lot of us, it's a part of the uh, collective memory of the city. I mean, Tatsum is a very important place in the city, as I will talk about. And, this is, I used to play on those exact same uh, lions, uh, and now my friend's son is playing on them. So it's, it's not, for all of us, it's something that we have a close connection to. Uh, but as I said, it does go beyond the park, and it's a very heterogeneous crowd, and that's one of the most important things, one of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of the movement that all these very different groups of people have come together. So we'll start with Kaya, who will talk about the background of this, and um, I'll keep this up there for um, if you want to make sure. I can also post this on the next uh, Facebook site. Um, and we'll give you the background and then just start discussing all together. Okay. Uh, do you think that uh, I should use the microphone? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, 17 days we took Turkey. For uh, those of us who were uh, part of this, uh, these events wholeheartedly, for those of us, for most of those of us who were uh, involved in these events, to some degree, those 70 days were uh, among the most happiest days of our lives. Why? Uh, prior to these events, of course, uh, not everyone in Turkey, but certain sections of uh, the Turkish population who were not supportive uh, of the government, we were in such a mood that uh, there wasn't much hope uh, for our country, and that uh, there was a feeling of that the fact that we were somehow being cornered and that there was nothing left to do. Then suddenly the mood for us changed. We are here to stay, we are part of this country, 
and uh, we will defend our rights and freedoms no matter uh, what uh, cost. The significance of these events for most of us is this change in uh, psychology. Now, why, well, uh, why well, was there such a psychology and uh, how it changed? As it was uh, summarized uh, in the video, let's remember uh, what happened. Initially, there were uh, a relatively small group uh, protesting against plans to build a shopping uh, mall in a uh, central park. These were uh, civic initiatives, uh, grassroots uh, groups, several hundred, perhaps at best uh, several thousand. They were forcibly evicted from the uh, square by police uh, brutality. Uh, one uh, morning, they were st uh, staging a uh, sitting and they were forcibly evacuated during a dawn raid. On that same day, uh, those uh, friends tried to set up a uh, sitting in the square once they were evicted from the park. They tried to set up a sitting in the square and they were once again forcibly evicted uh, from the square. So uh, they issued a call, let's protest this late in the evening uh, at 7 p.m. Let's make a, uh, we will make a public press uh, declaration, come and we are inviting everyone to come and uh, join us. This, this was the declaration of these several hundred grassroots uh, groups, which were nominally supported by the uh, Chamber of Architects and several unions, but uh, basically a group of uh, environmentalists. And what happened at uh, 7 p.m. that day, May 31st, is that a large part of the population did come out on the streets to support uh, those people in that struggle. I mean, it was uh, basically uh, the sheer size of the uh, support was unexpected by uh, everyone, I guess. Who came to support them? First and foremost, uh, left-wing political uh, parties. They said that, okay, we will be there at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, we will try to get into the uh, taxi square. But not only the usual suspects, suspects, the left-wing groups. Football uh, fan groups, they said that, okay, we will be there in taxi at 7 uh, p.m. Eh? Uh, and in, in addition to these groups, left-wing groups and uh, football groups, large number of uh, people who are not affiliated with any political organization or, or uh, other organization also came as this picture, uh, I believe, amply uh, illustrates. What had made uh, these people come to the uh, streets? There cannot be a single uh, reason. It was an accumulation of several reasons. First, of course, police brutality. Not only against the environmentalists, but there was a series of police brutality being witnessed in Turkey uh, for the past uh, weeks, beginning with the crushing of the uh, May 1st uh, demonstration. Yes, uh, of course. And uh, before that, again, police brutality uh, against a group who were protesting against the conversion of a vintage uh, cinema into a uh, shopping mall. So on one hand, there was this police brutality. However, uh, on its own, police brutality cannot, of course, be the reason, because there were uh, examples of police brutality which hadn't uh, met with uh, such reaction from the people. What had happened prior to uh, the uh, Gezi Park crackdown was that the government uh, had imposed restrictions on the sale of uh, alcohol. 
perhaps the, those restrictions in themselves were not so much draconian. But the Prime Minister himself had made a speech disclosing his intentions, saying that uh, we are not against alcohol. If people want to drink alcohol, they can drink it at their homes. What does this mean? What will come next? So this was probably the last uh, straw uh, in the head, and the anxiety uh, of the people, coupled with the uh, police brutality, it all merged in one uh, specific uh, moment and for basically ordinary people as well as football fans and uh, political groups in, into the uh, streets and not only uh, to the streets in, of Istanbul but to the streets of several cities and significantly police came with uh, water cannons and uh, tear gas I am uh, ending it however people did not disperse I mean they were dispersed uh, and uh, they came back. Of course, uh, I should say that, you know, we came back, uh, all of us, I mean, they threw uh, tear gas uh, at us, we escaped to the side streets and then uh, came back. So this continued into the morning and uh, towards the uh, afternoon, as the disturbances were uh, continued, as more and more ordinary people were coming out on the streets throughout the country, police pulled, ha, had to pull back from Gezi Park, and Gezi Park was once again reoccupied by our friends. Okay, so thank you, Kaya. Maybe to add on that the alcohol ban was upon that ban. Regulations was a triggering factor, but along with that, before that, uh, regulations on abortion, uh, all kinds of lifestyle, issues and the uh, environmental issues have been adding up. Uh, next we're going to talk about taxing those are very significant because it's been traditionally the site of May 1st demonstrations and this year there's a big crackdown because people tried to get there and they were not allowed by the police. Uh, next we're going to look at the media aspect of it and Fırat will be talking about it and he's been running one of the blogs or involved with one of the blogs uh, that have been supplying information. Hello and thanks for coming. Uh, um, <coughs> uh, when we split up the parts uh, to talk about, uh, I got the part of media, uh, mass media and its leg. Uh, mostly, and uh, also the role of the social media uh, in the initiation of the protests and in the accumulation of uh, the creative uh, part of the resistance. Uh, the slide you see, I'm not sure if, uh, how many of you are familiar with that. Uh, CNN Turk is the Turkish partner of CNN International and it's one of the two most respected TV channels in Turkey. Ah, sorry, CNN Türk, I was saying, is the Turkish partner of CNN International and it's one of the two most respected news channels in Turkey. And the Penguin documentary you see on my left, on the left, uh, is broadcast uh, during the night that Kaya was talking about the march of hundreds of thousands of people. And this is the news channel. In neither of, in, in no, none of the uh, channels uh, was it possible to see anything related to the uprising, nor the uh, discontent uh, of the citizens. And this, uh, for understandable reasons, pushed, in a sense, people to use social media. On that night, 500,000 Twitter accounts were opened in Turkey. And the daily uh, circulation number of tweets in Turkey is around 7 million normally. Since that night, it's like 15 million, so it's more than double. And the first uh, popular hashtag, Diran Gezi, which means uh, resist Gezi, uh, was shared only on that night uh, by people from Turkey and by people outside of Turkey 2 million uh, 100,000 times just uh, on that night. So there was uh, a huge involvement in the social media, I would say. 
And this continued for like three days, after which the mainstream channels, the news channels, uh, were put under pressure and they had to start reporting uh, about the events. And that also corresponds more or less to the time that people were able to reoccupy the park and push the, push the police uh, off the park. And after that, the penguin became, became a symbol of the resistance. <laughs> Uh, there was, uh, in the last day of, of the resistance, a penguin statue in the park uh, and people were posing uh, in front of the statue. And also it was used uh, as, a humor, humorous, uh, as, as an uh, element of humor uh, by the resistors themselves. Maybe we can pass on to the next one. Uh, no, the one uh, in front of him. Ah, yeah. And that is uh, Hulk TV, one of the few channels that uh, reported from the square and that reported about what was going on, uh, it has less than 0.5% uh, share in terms of uh, audience. So it was basically a channel that nobody was uh, basically aware of before the resistance, but became very popular by the people who wanted to learn about what's going on. And that uh, screenshot uh, was taken from Taksim and Yeşilköy in a live uh, broadcast. Taksim is the place that the resistance is going on and Yeşilköy uh, is where the airport is. Uh, and at that time Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Prime Minister, had returned from his uh, trip to Africa and all of the mainstream channels were now broadcasting him <laughs> at the same time. And as a protest, uh, they uh, put uh, Penguin documentary. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that is more or less uh, what has been going on in the media. And I'd like to talk about one more thing about the media. Uh, excuse me. And after the uh, lift of the ban or the censure on what was going on, another kind of struggle started. A struggle of disinformation, so to say. News were broadcast about people, uh, resistors, I mean, drinking beers and making group sex in mosques uh, for supporting their uh, occupy, occupy movements. And uh, in uh, seven of the in seven of the nationally circulating newspapers, uh, after the speech of the Prime Minister, uh, all the seven of them came up with the same heading uh, and the same uh, front cover. Not even a single word was changed. It was obviously served by, by the government, uh, word by word, uh, what they can touch upon and what they cannot. And, and after, the, after that, uh, the discourse uh, was, so to say, started. The disinformation on the one hand, and uh, the extreme amount of uh, media apparatus use on the other hand. I'd like to show uh, two footage from here. Yeah. Uh, that is the pe people marching from uh, the Bosphorus Bridge for the first time in the history of Turkey apart from the marathons, where it is uh, legally official to cross that. And that, uh, that photograph and the footage, the moving image, uh, was declared openly as Photoshop, uh, trying to make people believe that did not, this did not take place at all. Uh, and there are a lot of those photographs. That is the cultural center. Uh, you, you, you shall recognize this, we saw in the film the putting of this flama and after that more and more flamas came and this became a symbol for us and every day when we woke up we ran to that square and saw that the, the posters were there and then uh, it was okay for us we could understand that the resistance was still continuing and the first thing that the government did after uh, they set up the police force there was to remove the posters and create a scene as you know. And the last thing I'd like to touch upon uh, very briefly to uh, not spend too much time is the uh, creative part and the joyful part of the resistance. Uh, uh, Turkey is a country with 28 years of uh, age average. So we are a very young population and that young population is uh, 
very skillful in terms of use of technical and digital media, apart from uh, fighting in the barricades with the police, and sometimes at the same time, tweeting on the one hand. Uh, uh, no, I don't have that picture. There is actually a picture of a protester who is simultaneously both tweeting and running from the police, but uh, we don't have it right now. And I'd like to show some images from uh, the uh, resistors. The Chapulju word became like a pride for us. Uh, this was stated by the Prime Minister, which, and this is uh, an adjective which means looter, right? Hoodla. What? Hoodla. Hoodla and looter, so enemy of the state, enemy of the society kind of connotation. And it was reappropriated by the protesters and us. And it was like a, an adjective of pride, and people started writing Chapulju everywhere. Maybe we can show the Wikipedia uh, article here. And uh, playing with the English uh, language, uh, a chapuling word was <laughs> created. And now it's uh, in, in the Wikipedia site as well. And it draws its uh, energy from various sites. Uh, fan groups were involved. My friend Beste is going to talk about them, so I skip. But Istanbul United is a very good example to show the solidarity between the three victims in Istanbul that are constantly fighting, that never come together. And actually, a month before the uh, resistance started, one citizen was killed because of the clashes between those teams. But now, in this picture, you see them crossing the bridge, and the name, hence the name, Istanbul United. Uh, this is uh, a scene from the daily life. And this is what actually I want to emphasize. Neşe direnişin kahkasıdır in Turkish means uh, joy is the laughter of resistance. Although we were very sorrowful, people were dying, people were getting injured, people never lost their sense of humor. And actually humor was uh, maybe one of the most strong factors that kept us strong against the massive uh, attack by the government. And one of the most humorous things I find <laughs> Uh, maybe you remember uh, the scene. This, this is the uh, villain king in Game of Thrones, Jeffrey Baratheon, one of the most uh, hated figures in Turkey. And the, he's photoshopped with the face of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And this was one of the most uh, circulating images during the resistance. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Fırat. And we'll. Yes, this is actually some of these pictures we have uh, were taken by me, and we thought it would be more useful to have like personal, personal touch. And this they will now talk about the park itself and the life in the park and sort of what it meant for the communal life in Turkey in general. Yes. Um, first of all, I am going to use we while I'm speaking for two reasons. First, I was in the park like most of us here from Turkey. And second, it is kind of a spirit right now in Turkey. Although you can't be physically in the park, if you are supporting the protesters, you are calling yourself a protester too. So my mother, for instance, she is 68 years old and she can't walk anymore. Uh, but she keeps telling we, and she's doing her best from her own home in order to uh, let other people know what's going on. So I'm going to use the phrase we while I'm talking. So as Kaya said, uh, in the afternoon, June 1st, we got the park back. And once we got the park back, everyone was so happy because we got the park back. And it uh, continued for the next 15 days. Although we had a lot of challenges, although it was the first time for the Turkish society, for Turkish people, uh, that they occupied somewhere for two weeks. And that full experience, uh, I think, was unique because it was the first time. And also, that was, the, uh, that was huge. That was a massive gathering of people from different beliefs, different backgrounds, different ideologies, etc., etc. So what happened is, after June 1st in the afternoon and um, June 2nd in the morning, everybody was trying to find out what to do next. Because yes, we were in the park, yes, there were tents now that we were setting, and we were going to stay, but then what? 
Then uh, the Stacks and Solidarity Group, which also uh, kind of became the um, gathering point, gathering organization of this uh, movement, which had more than 100, 100 I think, organizations within it, uh, started to figure out what's going to happen next with the people. And what happened in two days was amazing because there was this new town, this new village inside this park. It is similar in some ways to uh, the Occupy Wall Street Zuccotti Park, uh, but I saw the park, Zuccotti Park also because I was living in New York City at that moment and I can tell you that the Gezi Park example was maybe ten times bigger uh, in terms of the space, first of all, Gezi Park is way larger than Zakoti Park, and also the experience, what we did. Uh, if I, I think there are two uh, categories, the permanent things that stayed in the park for 15 days and the temporary ones. The permanent things were kitchens, for instance, the infirmary, the pharmacy, the library, um, playground for kids, a stage, a professional stage, uh, a TV station broadcasting from inside the park, uh, as well as a radio station that was uh, live 24 hours inside the park, and uh, free cigarettes points give and take. Uh, so, and again, it happened in less than two weeks. It happened in four days or something, then we lived this. And the temporary things that weren't there all the time, but temporarily we had them, were hairdressers. They came one day to cut the hairs of the protesters who were staying there at night because they couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't even have their baths frequently, etc., etc. So uh, massage therapists, they came to help the protesters. Uh, tattoo artists were there and uh, they did everything for free, of course. Artists of all types, performance artists, uh, actors, painters, musicians, they came, uh, they, they, they were in us. They didn't come as artists different than common people. They were with us, but they also performed in the park uh, during this process. And uh, also this experience is unique because um, I already mentioned the different idea, people from different ideologies, different groups were there together, but um, they were together peacefully. Although they do not agree on everything, although they had different viewpoints, different approach to every single matter, they found a way to communicate peacefully. And uh, especially these fan groups, which Fred, I think, uh, perfectly explained, uh, were very important because fan groups in Turkey are generally known as apolitical, uh, except one example that was the leader of all these fan groups, Çarşı. Uh, but the football lovers, the soccer lovers, were inside the park. Uh, defending their country with all the other people. And uh, the differences among, among people did not cause any major incidents. And in a given day, or in a given 15 days, if cops were around, if the state was around this particular neighborhood, I'm sure there would be a lot of major incidents because this is a large city. We are living in a uh, metropolitan city. And in Gezi Park, we didn't see crime nearly at all. So I think that's another important thing about our uh, experience. And humor, Prat also talked about humor. Yes, we saw a lot of humor in the park. Not only in the park, uh, yes, there are millions, yes, yes, I'm gonna talk about this in a sec. <laughs> this is great. Um, humor became a cop mechanism, yes, to us, uh, but at the same time, it was uh, a resistance tool for protesters. I think it was very political, all these humor that, was, that were produced uh, anywhere in the city was a resistance tool for us. And also it underlined the absurdity of the government's acts itself. This, okay. this picture was taken, I think, on June 14th or 13th, uh, I'm not sure. 14th. It's um, 
6.38, about 7 a.m. Uh, June 14th, Friday. Yes, yes. This is a German uh, pianist and musician, and he brought his own piano for solidarity with Turkish resistors, and he stayed there for hours, for two days, and there were a lot of uh, other musicians who helped him during the process, and people had the chance to listen to music and to sing songs all together in Taksim, uh, in Taksim Square near the park. And when they cleared the park on June 15, I heard that the piano was also in custody by the police. Uh, they, and he's, I think it's been released. By yes, yes, yes. I, I think now it is. But he, he tried two or three days in order to get his piano back. I don't know. I can talk until the morning, but I don't think that is necessary. Uh, so this is what we lived in the park. Generally, if you have questions, we can all answer and to them. And contributions from other friends? Yes, please. So, uh, as since then, the park was cleared out on last Saturday, and since Monday, the forums have uh, sprung up in all the parks in the city. This is a site from one of them, and this is a list for tonight's uh, forums in 40 different parks around the city that they're growing. And uh, Ramadan has been another, uh, the standing man has been another sort of phenomenon uh, activity that just started last Monday night. This guy just started standing in the middle of the square um, and it became huge all of a sudden, within several hours, and people started standing around him and the police uh, took him to custody, people who were standing for standing. So if you walk, that's a problem, if you stand, that's a problem. Um, so that's what we did last night at 8 outside, so when we're done here we might go stand for 5 minutes outside as well. And now I'd like to switch to a general forum discussion and the, the forums in Istanbul have now rules. Everyone speaks for 2 minutes, you don't uh, applaud not to make anyone living around the park uncomfortable because it makes a lot of noise, so they make hand movements, uh, so it's a whole set of things that I'm not yet familiar with because I've been here. That's how fast things change. Uh, so we'd like to give the floor to you now, and especially the other Turkish members who if you want to add something or from you if you have any questions, please. demonstrations were largely spontaneous and I don't think that for the overall picture there isn't any inspiration but for the Gezi Park occupation I mean you can answer that more insightful way. Uh, yeah there, there were similarities but I can't say that it was a repetition of any of these moments but of course there were inspirations I don't know if there wasn't this library in Zuccotti Park there may not be a there might not have been a uh, library in our park. So, of course, there are some inspirations, there are some things that we learn, but I don't think that it is, there's this major one particular event that kind of gave us this start in that particular way. Yeah, it wasn't any model. I yes, yes, yes. We were yes. inspired, no, no of course, from uh, everywhere, but there wasn't a particular model, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd like... Oops. I'd like to draw uh, on two issues. Uh, one is the parallel that the government tried to establish, actually. Uh, they were very careful uh, for not letting any identification with the Arab Spring. And all the examples they were giving were from the Western world and the Occupy movement, uh, because they don't consider themselves as uh, autocrats or tyrants. You know? They don't want to identify with that. Uh, and the they don't want to have the same end. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, and the second thing, uh, you know, 
there are uh, political moments in the history of humanity all the time, and these things, whether we recognize them or not, go in waves. I mean, this was the case in the 60s, this was the case in the 1840s, and this was the case all the time. And uh, whether or not we acknowledge them consciously, it was, uh, in my opinion, obviously an inspiration, the whole stuff that was going on, starting with the first hashtag in English, which was Occupy Gezi, a very uh, obvious reference. Uh, two examples like the skills of people, for instance, that the first person who was uh, live uh, casting, who was used streaming, was a person who was involved in Occupy New York. And after that, after that first big night, he made a workshop and transferred that knowledge and skill to everyone. Uh, so that the next day there were tens of live stream channels in all the streets of Istanbul. And this, I guess, we owe to our comrades in other parts of the world. And also the international solidarity, it was not one-sided. Maybe we can show the anonymous hex uh, here. Yeah, uh, you, you are familiar with Anonymous, I guess, uh, the hackers, uh, political hacker community. Uh, the, we have a red hack in Turkey. They are working closely with Anonymous. Some members are maybe members to both organizations. We don't know their identities. Uh, and after the brutal attacks by the police, Red Hack and Anonymous started counter attacks on uh, government sites. Uh, including the Turkish government's very own website, for instance. And the last example I want to draw is the crowd-sourced uh, uh, New York Times example. Can we skip to that? Crowdsourcing is no, by no means the invention of the Turkish, nor by any other nation, uh, I would say. Uh, but after that first day, there was an Indiegogo campaign to fundraise $50,000. Uh, to be able to uh, publish an ad about Turkey in New York Times. And within two days, uh, more than $90,000 were collected. And among those contributors were people from Turkey, Turkish people living abroad, and other people who wanted to support our cause. So it is, uh, in this sense, I consider very global, but not global in the direct connotation by the people who took part in the resistance. And also, I mean, we should... <laughs> Uh, all keep in mind that the uh, resistance movement was not a homogeneous movement. Sure. So for certain people inside the movement, I mean their inspiration came from Occupy Wall Street. For certain people uh, in the movement, their occupation uh, inspiration came from the Paris Commune of 1871. And as to what will happen next, we don't really know. That's what, it, what makes all of this so very exciting and a little scary, but the, the questions we've been getting, or at least I've been getting since we got here, was mostly like, oh, it looks so horrible, how did you get out of Istanbul, you live in the middle of everything, and uh, yes, it is scary to some extent, but as Kaya and others have also stressed and throughout also presented on this in the morning, it's also... It makes you feel very much alive, which is not something my generation has really felt. I don't know what the others <laughs> in the audience feel, but it's really, um, it's, I don't want to say it's great, people are dying, but uh, it is a, something that we have never experienced before, and there's a very joyful side of it. But one thing it did is to, uh, what Kaya started at with, I've been always looking at job ads outside of Turkey the last year or so, and I keep on sort of trying to decide whether to stay in Turkey or leave, and now it's like, well, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of us. There's hundreds and thousands of us, and it's worth staying and fighting for, you know, to, just to live the way we want to live, not to be dictated by one man. about the nature of the connection between um, discipline 
and urban life. And um, uh, we're making some more ideas about no, no longer afraid to touch yeah. each other, maybe. That was, um, so the idea of isolation and overcoming isolation and political repression, um, those are sort of associations that I'm making, and also in a much broader context. Um, the other thing that I was wondering in terms of the uh, urban aspect of this had to do with gentrification. Again, gentrification, um, not gentrification in the sense of a boy or or something like that, but much more in seniors, in a sense, um, as a really erasure of, of, of urban memory and urban community. Um, I just wanted to add something, um, especially in response to the question um, about the parallelity or isolation and all the other moments of the struggle around the world. I mean, for that, it's maybe important to emphasize that um, actually. There are many like, local specific uh, reasons and accumulations uh, for the struggle, but on the other hand, there are not maybe two, um, like, two specific, uh, they are not only specific to Turkey, but when we talk about gentrification and uh, like neoliberal policies in general and the um, like things that come along with it, like the uh, like rapid privatization processes and the shrinking of public spaces and like demolishing of cultural historical um, places and profit oriented um, like buildings instead and all these and maybe more on, on general terms like precarity and um, a crisis of representation, right? Both in um, parliamentary politics and on the level of media. So. I mean, thinking of all these um, reasons, then we can really um, like easily make connections with what happened in the Occupy movements in uh, Europe, or Tahrir Square, or um, yeah, all around uh, all around the world, as well as what's happening right now in Sao Paulo and uh, Beirut and uh, Bulgaria. Bulgaria. So I mean, when we also discuss what's next, um, it's it's. Quite important to actually emphasize these parallels and these like common reasons behind them, and, uh, like focusing on how to make this struggle more global, actually. So, just one thing, um, like it's um, maybe I mean the old motto of the alternative globalization movement, um, like think globally, act globally, is coming into circulation again because I mean we're talking about these forums, people embracing their locality and being concerned with their uh, the most local issues. But on the other hand today we saw that people were standing in Sao Paulo, I mean following the standing man um, example in Istanbul. So I mean from the local to the global there's actually a little step right now, so it's exciting. Any other comments? Thank you, very interesting panel. Uh, um, no, I, I read one uh, interesting and, and quite critical article uh, about protests as well in a Belgian newspaper from Opinion Piece, and he his point was that. Uh, so that it's, it's a protest for more uh, democracy in, in, in Turkey, but at the same time, um, especially, I don't know what your name is, I do wish to forget about, right. all about the uh, uh, images and symbols being used. And the thing that he said was some of the images that were being used, or quite a lot of them, uh, go back into the history of Turkey. Uh, very famous outlook, but also other kind of images and symbols that are taken along with the protests. And his point then is that this history of Turkey has never really has never been really democratic. It's a bit of a contradiction. The, the the symbols they use and the general idea of, of the protest on, on the online democracy. But perhaps it has something to do with the diversity of groups in with that there is these this very 
actual, this, this, nowadays, uh, we're living in the now, but there are also people marching along uh, with, with other ideas, perhaps. Uh, I don't know, that was something. Uh, let's take comments from everyone because it's already 10.30 and you know, let's wrap it up. Let's get all the comments and then you know, those of us who want to can say a few things. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this debate first. I have three uh, important questions. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm wondering about uh, the Kurdish community in Turkey. Uh, whether it's involved in it or not. Uh, and uh, the second question maybe was mentioned before, uh, but I'm much more interested in, um, let's say, political consciousness of uh, the majority of protesters, uh, people involved in these demonstrations. If you could say, I have a deeper respect what you said, that uh, people with different ideologies participated on these protests, but at the same time, my question is, whether we can talk about uh, anti-neoliberal movement in Turkey in some way or not, whether most of the protesters uh, uh, are focused on neoliberal politics as uh, uh, the main enemy, and I think that this would be the moment uh, uh, which would help us uh, how to understand the movement in the global, uh, on the global level. And the second, uh, and the last question, the third question is, what about, I've heard about uh, let's say nationalist or conservative uh, uh, part of the movement is pretty weak and uh, it's, it's, it's not so much obvious, but at the same time, what about the kinoists in, 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 the, in the very open movement? What about their potential and the potential of premier, uh, premier you know, let's say, anti-demonstrations? Uh, I've heard about it, I'm not sure whether it's true, so there's the questions. And that the government is trying to react on, uh, on, on your great movement in a way that uh, they are trying to mobilize, let's say, culture of this horrors to the whole country. And yes, that's it. Okay. One last. Yes, no more speaks to us. Yo, uh, uh, thanks for, I mean, I, I heard just some time, but we discussed already yesterday some of the things. Uh, like, one of the things that I'm also concerned politically, like, uh, all across Europe we have simultaneously different movements, but you already had very strong protests in Portugal, Spain, Greece, and you had millions of the streets, you know, coming from all these big cities, but nothing really changed. Right? There is like, uh, even the political class as such doesn't need or doesn't even pretend to have legitimacy anymore. They're just like government, where most of them are like technocratic even government. So, one of the questions, of course, that seems out of very important of these movements is also a question of further political organization. And I would just ask if you feel that there is some kind of embryo of these political platforms that is happening in this 36th of political forum, forum like what we were talking about a little bit yesterday, if that's certain kind of future way to go, or maybe to rethink certain trade union organizations that are missing in the context. Then the second one would be also like a part of the solidarity movements that are springing all across uh, Europe in support of different initiatives. Uh, there is also something that we should do locally against him, globally, yes, but also like act locally to like turn it, reverse it a bit, and to reinvent the taxing square in every square in every city. You know, it's like the solidarity movement is not enough, it's like important to kind of expand it in a real uh, like kind of global dimension. She said, and does anyone from the, I mean, we've already talked, so members of the Turkish community here, does anyone want to add anything? I mean, first, the uh, easy question, the participation of the Kurdish movement was problematic. Initially, they were on the streets. 
Then uh, they kept a low profile, and towards the end, uh, they kept a relatively mm -hmm. higher profile. I mean, they participated, uh, but they were not a decisive factor. Or, no, uh, they were a very strong presence, but they were present. Uh, perhaps in some of the uh, outside neighborhoods, they were present more, but uh, in the central city. Dersim söyledim. Dersim söyledim. Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I just wanted to to add, but sorry. Uh, and in Dersim, officially named, officially named Tunceli, uh, one of the Kurdish capitals in this, in Turkey, uh, there were also huge demonstrations and clashes with the police. So uh, they were involved, not uh, party-wise, uh, but uh, population-wise, I would add. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I mean, they were present, but uh, not, not very high profile most of the time. Regarding the uh, political stand, uh, is it anti neoliberalism? I would say, of course, yes. Uh, especially, I mean, the, the uh, movement centering around Gezi Park, the movement uh, against the demolishing of the cinema the anti-shopping mall, that is uh, part of an anti-neoliberal movement. However, for this uh, large-scale uprising, I think anti-neoliberalism should be f better framed in a different framework. This whole movement uh, can perhaps be seen as a reaction against majoritarian tendencies of the government for a pluralistic society. So on one hand, majoritarianism, which everyone knows can quickly evolve towards fascism. So fascistic potential of majoritarianism of the government on one hand on a plural conception of society. And yes, the majoritarian government is also a neoliberal government and we are anti-neoliberals, but what is at stake here is majoritarianism versus pluralism. The Atatürk issue is uh, very complicated and it uh, needs a lot of time to uh, consider here, but uh, people who have an affection for Atatürk were a large part of this movement, definitely. And I would say that uh, for, but not hardcore Atatürkist organizations, but ordinary people with a deep affection for Atatürk were probably the majority of the people uh, on the streets, not in Gates Park, but on the streets. And I should ask, remind you that uh, the evaluation of Atatürk is not the same for everyone. I mean, people who put up pictures of, uh, I am not an Atatürkist, people who put up pictures of Atatürk uh, on uh, their windows, they do not do it necessarily for authoritarian uh, people. So, the Islamist Reading of Atatürk is not the only reading of uh, Atatürk possible for ordinary people uh, on the streets. I think that sums up things uh, as much as they can be summed up. It is a very heterogeneous crowd. And, um, everyone has his, her own reasons, everyone has his, her own claims and demands, so that, that's the advantage and disadvantage, as I said. So thank you for all, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we'd like to actually, since the reception is also over, we'd like to step out in 10 minutes, stand for a while, and then if anyone's interested, and it's still early, we can go somewhere else to chat and uh, grab a beer. And thank you very much, Pesh, for allowing us to have this talk.